Okay, so uh, if we're ready, I'll, I'll do the intro and then we'll get going. Yep, let's do that. So uh, evening, everybody, and welcome to what I think is the third webinar of uh, 2021. Um, we started doing these webinars, uh, I think, on April the 1st last year. Um, had no idea that they would still be still be going and we'd still be in, in various forms of lockdown now a year later. Uh, but we've we've had a, a good range of speakers and uh, tonight's speaker, I think, uh, will be really interesting. So Steve Tonkin is going to talk to us about two eyes being better than one. Um, he's the author of many articles and several books on practical astronomy and has taught astronomy to adults and children for more than 35 years. Um, he's the Dark Skies advisor to the International Dark Sky Reserve and Cranbourne Chase area of outstanding natural beauty so something really important to all of us is preserving dark skies for us to go out and actually see the sky at night um, and he splits his time between doing this and astronomical outreach uh, he's a stem ambassador which uh, which i am too and i know is a very rewarding activity trying to encourage kids to to go into science really important thing and he writes a monthly column for bbc uh, sky at night magazine um, He's also a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and a founder member of Fording Bridge Astronomers. Where's Fording Bridge then? Um, between the New Forest and Cranbourne Chase, sort oh, of okay. nearer to the New Forest. Okay. So, so between Salisbury and Bournemouth, if you want places you've probably heard of before. <laughs> yeah, those, those are places I've heard of before, yeah. and the New Forest too. Okay, Steve, so thank you very much for um, joining us tonight. I'll, I'll uh, leave you to get on with it. And then at the end, we'll do the normal thing of um, taking questions. So Jolly those good. of you on watching on Zoom can uh, raise questions on Zoom. If you're on YouTube, you can do it in the chat on YouTube and uh, we'll pick those up at the end when Steve's finished. So Steve, over to you. Thank you and thanks for inviting me. Right, there will be questions. There'd better be questions because I'm going to leave gaps uh, in what we're doing because uh, of a number of things. Right, you should have my screen up there now. So what over the next sort of 40, 45 minutes or so, what I want to do is go through why use binoculars. Um, if you are going to use them, how do you choose something halfway decent? If you're going to do, or more, and actually what comes into that more important is what you avoid. Um, and then if you've got it, how do you use it? And how do you find things to look at and all the rest of it. So it's uh, um, quite a quite a bit to cover. I apologise to anybody who was at the uh, Deep Sky section meeting where I gave this a while ago. Or anyone from Fording Bridge or Wessex or anywhere else I've given this same talk relatively recently. But anyway, it is how it is. So as we said, we start off with why binoculars? Well, we're mostly told when we're starting off. Um, I wasn't, I didn't have a choice, my dad just passed them to me, but you know, start with binoculars, not a telescope. Um, ignoring the fact that a binocular is really just two telescopes joined together in tandem. Okay, low power, small aperture, you, usually, but not always. But the reason for that is they've got nice wide fields of view and they're easy to set up. But what a lot of people don't realize is that they're excellent serious instruments as well. It's a heck of a lot of serious, if you if astronomy is ever serious or sincere astronomy that you can do with um, with binoculars and some stuff you can do actually more easily with binoculars than anything else and we'll sort of touch on some of that later and the reason for all this they're incredibly portable at least in their handhold sizes which is what most people think of when we're thinking about binoculars incredibly easy to set up and how difficult is it to put the strap around your neck? Always do that unless you want to support uh, binocular repair outfits. Um, whip off the caps, up to your eyes, focus, and you're going. And that's really important, particularly in you know, something like British climate where, you know, well, I've been out Turf Hill, one of my favorite observing spots in the forest. And, you know, the guys were there, who've got their imaging rigs there, you know, sort of, about an hour into them setting up, they're just about ready and the clouds come over and the rain comes down and I've been observing for 45 minutes at least, I'm winning. So there, that's good. And there's also what's called the binocular advantage. 
And the usual question at this point is, well, what's the binocular advantage? And the answer is it's times 1.4. And what this means is in low light conditions, and we are really talking about low light conditions where things are sort of getting close towards the limit of detection, a single aperture of say 70 millimeters, which uh, reasonable size for a small telescope, has about the same, you get about the same detection rate with it as you will with binoculars of 50 uh, millimeters and the 1.4 times 50 is the 70. So it's, it's equivalent to 1.4 times that, that aperture and this is only for detection of, of faint stuff. Okay, This obviously isn't for normal day-to-day -day stuff in bright light but a lot of the fun with binoculars I find is trying to detect stuff, trying to get hold of stuff at the limits of visibility. So at the moment when we've got things like um, that whole Virgo coma cluster of galaxies um, coming over, you know, to be out at midnight when that's culminating, when it's sort of on the meridian, when it's, you know, it's highest in the sky, seeing how many galaxies I can find in that lot with binoculars. It's just fun and it's, it's, pushing, your, it's pushing your observing skills and all the rest of it. And it's for two reasons. Um, it's one's called statistical summation and that essentially means that if you're using two detectors you improve your probability of detection of things which are um, rare and with the, the rods of our eyes actually apparently can be stimulated by single photons so you know this is, becomes relevant certainly and then there's what's called physiological summation and anybody who does imaging will know what this is it's basically it's stacking if you got several images and you stack them together in something like Deep Sky Stacker or APP or whatever people are using nowadays, um, what what happens is the the signal gets reinforced and the noise starts to cancel each other out. And we have noise in our optic nerves because our there's quite a lot of noise actually because the um, the visual cortex is right at the back of our heads. So there's got a long way to go. You get a lot of a lot of neural noise, and it's partially wiped out by this what's physiological summation. So you increase your signal to noise ratio, and you can try this for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. It's just somewhere fairly dim. Okay, it does need to be fairly dim lighting. Get a book that you can just read with two eyes, and get it to the limit of where you can just detect something, and then close one eye. It doesn't matter which one, and all of a sudden what was visible beforehand stops being visible now. You're seeing the, the effect of mostly physiological summation. And then you've got this false stereopsis. Things look three-dimensional. Uh, of course they're not. You, you don't get 3D um, imaging, 3D at light years away. You, you, bear, you barely get it at you know, a few tens of meters away. But you know, if you look, some, look at something like um, I don't know, something with coloured stars in something like the, the double cluster or something like that. Those red stars tend to give it depth. So, you know, it's, and of course it's not real, but it's enjoyable. And if visual observing can't be enjoyable, then why not do it? The other thing that I'm told exists, I've ne never happened to me, is that sometimes it apparently has been the case, people have been looking for something with one eye and they can't find it. Um, and they sort of move their eye around a little bit and there it's there and when it was on their blind spot the whole time. Um, you, can't, you, you can't do that with, uh, with two eyes, it just doesn't work. You can only be on the blind spot of one eye. So that apparently is another reason that uh, two eyes certainly work better than one. So I think that's sort of why, but then what sort of thing do we want? Well, we need to sort of get our, our hand, um, heads around the sorts of binoculars there are. And I divide them into three groups. Um, the first two, poro prism and roof prism, are fairly um, non-contentious. And then I put a third one in there, which is ones with angled eyepiece. So I put 45 degrees because that's where mine are. They will either be roof prism or poro prism binoculars with a bit of added gubbins in there to angle the eyepieces, usually, usually roofs. Okay, so this is what a poro prism binocular looks like. It's one that everybody thinks of. It's got the crank body and the light comes in through the objective lens. This prism here turns the image the right way round. The next one turns it the right way up because images, if you just got the 
objective and the eyepiece would be inverted and back to front. And so you get a correct image and uh, it's all sort of nice and easy to use. And the other nice advantage of this, let's put the light path in there, is that because you're folding the light path, you're making the instrument shorter. So it's going to be lighter, it's going to be um, less unwieldy because you're not dealing with something quite a lot longer. So there's certain advantages to that. But the main reason for those prisms is not any of that. It's really just to get your image the right way around, the right way up, because binoculars are usually used for terrestrial purposes. Advantages of them is in any given price range, I must admit this is starting to change, but very slowly, for reasons that will become obvious in a mo. Um, they're generally the best quality in a given price range. But they're relatively easy to maintain, and particularly if you're going for budget ones, you need to. They're, you've got to see these as sort of like kit bits of um, kit equipment that you're going to have to work on occasionally to keep them up to scratch, as it were. Uh, but their disadvantages are they're bulkier and heavier than roof prisms, and the cheap ones, and this is the reason you need to maintain them, they easily lose collimation, which means something different in binoculars to what it means in telescopes. Okay, collimation in binoculars means your images lining up together, so you don't get a double image. It's not a big deal, well it is a big deal, it's, it's annoying, um, if your images are so far out that your brain doesn't try and put them together again. When it does become it can be quite distressing. It's when they're only slightly out and your eyes and your visual system try to merge these images and you get people getting headaches and nausea and all the rest of it when that happens. So you do need to, to watch that. And that's with the, with the uh, very low quality ones. The other kind of the roof prisms, they look as though they're straight through because the axis of the eyepiece is usually in line with the axis of the objective. They're not straight through at all. Um, they've got uh, a pair of prisms here, one of which has a roof to it, which is why it's called a roof prism. Um, we won't go into prism optics right now. And you've, the other thing to notice is the way it focuses. The Poro focuses by moving the eyepiece backwards and forwards, usually, not all, but that's usually the way. All roof prisms focus, or nearly all, by moving an internal prism backwards and forwards. So your, your focusing is entirely internal for most roof prism binoculars. Um, a, a exception to that is something like the um, little Vixen um, 32 mil Astro binoculars. They're not like that. So this is your light path here, um, bounces around the prisms. Again, it's, it's folding it and it's effectively what it's doing is it's turning the image right way up and right way around and out the back. So. Advantages, lighter, much more compact than Poros, and much easier to waterproof, and that's due to that internal focusing. Disadvantage is they're more expensive than the equivalent quality Poro, and it's to do with that roof, actually. The angles in prisms have to be done reasonably precisely, but the angle of that roof has to be done 90, 90 times more precisely than um, any of the angles in Poro prisms. Went. So that's um, precision is expensive. And they're much, much more difficult to self-maintain. Um, I tend not to. I send mine back to the, uh, if, they, if they need work done on them, I, I send them back to the distributor, which in my case, usually Opticron. And their aperture is also limited by the straight through design. Um, if you just imagine, because they are, appear to be straight through, if you had 100 millimeter aperture binoculars with that, the closest your optical axes can be, assuming no metal around the lenses, is going to be 100 millimeters, which is much wider than anybody's eyes are. So you're limited really to effectively to about 50 millimeters. Some people have tried to push up a little bit more than that, but once you get up to 50, you have a very, very large minimum interpupillary distance. So you're limiting the number of people who can use it, which is why most roof prisms, well, some go up to say 50 mil, most of them uh, manufacturers stop them at about 42 mil birders like that and then your angled eyepieces it's like that and they're just great um, if you're going for big binoculars then with things that you can't handhold then go for angled eyepieces if you can okay they are much more comfortable to use if you like observing standing up which I do um, especially for high elevations because you're not getting a crick in your neck 
um, but they are much more expensive because you've got extra glass in there to put it through an angle and unless it's really good quality glass it's going to um, degrade the image so it's like that they must be mounted the normal way of using binoculars and let's get this um, sort out now is you don't do what loads of people do is sort of put the binoculars up to your eyes and then lift your head and try and try finding something um, it really really doesn't work and you can spend a lot of time looking for things and not seeing them the way to do it is to look at the spot in the sky where you think the object is most likely to be and with uh, trying with not to move your head or to move your eyes put the binoculars in the way and if you can't see it, what it, what it is, it, well, it's either too faint to be seen or 99 times out of 100, it's higher than you're looking. We, we all have this thing where we we tend to overestimate the angle that we're looking up. And it's, it happens loads of things. One of the things actually responsible for the moon illusion. But the um, the the whole thing is just go for it. And if you can't see it, go up and then. Uh, you can do things like spiral searches if you if it's still not there but it's, you usually find it just by going up a little bit and they need some sort of finder for the same reason um, if you've got angled eyepieces you can't use that shove them in front of your you know shove them in front of your eyes and just <laughs> the direction you're looking because when you do that they're going to be looking somewhere else 45 degrees away so what do you want well um, probably most people know we'll go through it anyway <coughs> excuse me Binoculars are described by two numbers, which is magnification by aperture. Something like an eight by 40, so that magnifies eight times, eight diameters, um, and it's 40 millimeter aperture. Just about everybody can handhold those without even having to be shown how to and, and hold them steadily enough. That's one of the reasons birders like them. 10 by 50s, most people can handhold. Um, if they're shown how to do it properly. And the proper way is not the way most people will hold, say, poroprism binoculars, which is grab them around the prism housings and do that. That is never the best way to uh, hold binoculars. Uh, we'll, but we'll go through how to hold them a little bit later. Um, something like 15 by 70s. Yeah, people say, yeah, I can handhold those. Well, yes, you can, but really, they really need to be mounted. Um, you know, handholding them for brief periods. Yeah, I mean, I, I do with mine. But something like, you know, sort of 100 mil binoculars really must be mounted. You do get the occasional he-man who says, yes, you know, I can hold my 25 by 100s. Yeah, but how steady are they made? OK, so what size do you want? I'm going to show you is some images of M35, a nice little open cluster in um, Gemini. And what it looks like in binoculars under my sort of sky. So I'm sort of on the outskirts of the new forest. So it's... Um, something like the Milky Way is usually pretty clear as long as the sky is clear. Um, so it, it, ca it can be very nice here, but it's, it's Bortle 4 if you know your Bortle scale. So it, it's yeah, sort of like semi-rural type, like, type sky. So that's what it looks like in 10 by 50s. These are all simulations, by the way. These are not photographs or drawings. 15 by 70s, it looks like that. And note what happens is that not only has it got bigger, but the sky background's got darker because you've increased the, ma the magnification by a greater factor than you've increased the aperture or you've increased the amount of light coming through. And that, and that means your extended object, which is in this case your sky, its light, its background light is being smeared out over more of your retina so it gets darker you get improved contrast and then I put my big ones up there which I usually use 37 times and it looks like that so there's quite a distinction in what you get and that's uh sort of shows that right light pollution has an enormous effect we'll just look at the big one and the little one and we'll see what it's like this is my normal skies Head down the road down to Bournemouth, where we sometimes go and do outreach in local schools, city there, and that's what you see. Uh, not a heck of a lot. Although you can see something in the big binos, which you can't see in the little ones. Um, aperture is one of the solutions to light pollution, but it's not really a good solution. Getting rid of the lights pointed where we need them is a good solution. You go up to somewhere like Loch Loyal or... Um, where I grew up, which was eight miles outside Bulawayo in what was then Rhodesia, 
um, where the lights went out anyway at 11 o'clock. Um, and this is the sort of thing you get. You cannot beat a good dark sky. You really can't. And this is why, you know, as Nick was saying at the beginning, you know, it's something we really all ought to be working towards, and not just for us, for wildlife, for our own health and everything else. Anyway, we're not doing a light pollution talk, so I'll leave that for now. I mentioned holding them. This here is the best way to hold small binoculars when you're looking significantly above the horizontal. And you'll notice the top joint of the thumb there, and you can try this yourself now, nobody's watching, um, because all your videos are off. Um, that joint fits right nicely in the corner of your eye, and that bone of your thumb fit rests nicely on your cheekbone. And what you've done is you've effectively created stable triangles. And as you get higher and higher and higher, more of the weight is actually taken on your head. So if you're on a recliner with a supported head, that's even better. If you don't do it like that, and you have your hands further down the binoculars, so there's your arms just holding it up all on your arms. As your arms get higher and higher, the blood supply to your arms to get higher than your heart reduces, you start getting the aches and the shakes, and it's not very effective at all. Um, if you're looking horizontally, do what the American military tell you, which is hold them right by the ends of the objectives there. Um, that's that's actually pretty good and it's actually but no, nothing is as bad as holding them around the prism housings where some manufacturers very kindly put little thumb and finger indentations and ask you to hold them there never understood why that is it never works best um, and how i know this is effective 10 by 50s when my son was nine years old we were out in the back garden and he had some lightweight 10 by 50s and the dad i've found something and he devised a little star hop to show me how to get to it from Triangulum, which uh, he knew I knew and I knew he knew. And uh, he independently discovered the cluster M34. Now, that's no big deal. It's easy to see in binoculars. But if a nine-year-old can do that, find it, and then devise a star hop, I reckon they're using the binoculars effectively. So, no, they won't be perfectly still. They don't have to be. We're after detection, not great detail. Using tripods, which a lot of people say, I think is a terrible idea. Um, the reason being the right-hand image there, you notice what's happening there. There's five legs involved, and they're all sort of competing for the same little bit of space time there. And as the higher and higher you look, the more and more you get a stiff neck. Um, never, never, never a good idea, I don't think, if you want to observe anything higher than about 45 degrees elevation. But you can use things like this. This is uh, called a neck pod. I uh, got this because Patrick Moore recommended it in a, his binocular astronomy book, which I got sometime in the 1980s, I think. Um, it's like a little monopod. It works on a strap around your neck. You have an extendable um, mono bit here and angle there. And it's, they're pretty effective. And because the bottom end of this rests on your breastbone, it's a reasonably good heart rate monitor as well. So while you're looking at the stars, you can also tell that you're still alive. Isn't that nice? Um, but a monopod itself, I think, is better. And if you get one of these, which is a trigger grip ball head on the end of it, that is, you. it's basically a ball head, which you have a trigger, which is under my fingers there, which you squeeze to release. And you can have this thing pointing in any part of the sky you like. Um, you do need to, as you look higher, you need to extend the monopod upwards. So you need a joint within reach of your hand there that you can release easily. And there, because it's released a, a lot and tightened up a lot, you know, sort of maybe hundreds of times in a single observing session, you need one that's adjustable. And a lot of them, a lot of the cheap ones aren't. So eventually they just get sloppy and they just won't hold the weight anymore. But uh, halfway decent monopod won't set you back a lot and it's um will have adjustable uh, uh, latches on it so you can quite easily uh, tighten it up when you need to but the the real way to do this and anybody who uses binoculars will know this is use a parallelogram um because the parallelogram holds you off the tripod holds you away from the tripod and the nice thing about it is if say i'm using something and I'm at that height, I can then have a youngster who maybe only comes up to my my shoulder height or chest height 
without moving the binocular, I can just drop the parallelogram and it's still pointing at exactly the same thing. So they're great for outreach. Um, here's another one sort of demonstrating the same thing. The, the camera's changed position and I've changed position and I've pulled a chair in the way for the left-hand one. But actually the, um, the tripod and has not changed position in between these two shots. This is still the same bit in my garden. Um, so on the right, I'm standing looking up and on the left, I'm reclined looking up. So you've got that sort of flexibility and reclined observing with binoculars is a marvelous thing to do. And yes, I have had to be woken up from doing it because it's, it's so relaxing. But you don't have to go for that sort of thing. You know, you can use household items to support uh, what you've got, or trees, or fences, or roofs of cars, or anything like that. Any support you can give it will be great. And this here is a you know, um, make-do monopod. It's actually a, a cheap, I think it's about four and a half quid, um, window cleaning squeegee. Never been used for cleaning windows. So here we've you just bungee the binoculars to the top end of it. Extensible, so that's great. And you've also got this cranked head here, so the bit that's meant to be vertical, where well, it actually doesn't need to be vertical um, at all. Uh, the monopods work almost as well, even when the thing's not vertical. Um, it's important to know. But anyway, here it sort of you notice it, it gives a clearance of astronomer's belly, which is probably a good thing. Okay, or the other extreme is this, which is called a star chair. It's basically you are sitting in a computerized altazimuth mount with nice big Fujinon binoculars, and um, she's got a little joystick controller there. But the whole, um, I think they put Argo Navis in some of them, and so you just tell it where you want to go, and the whole thing moves around and takes you there. And people build their own, so that's you know sort of the sort of extremes you can go to if you want to. If you're mounting binoculars, because they are pointing up a lot of the time, you will have a due problem. Nothing apart from Newtonian telescopes with solid tubes have adequate length dew shields. With them, it's the tube. So you do need to make your own. That's my um, finder on there. It's a Rigel Quick Finder, which is great because it's concentric circles and the outer one is almost exactly the same as the field of view of this with my favorite eyepieces in, which is... Well, this has got 1.8, that's got two. So it's, it makes star hopping a complete doddle. But you do need to extend the um, the sliding eyepieces on the objectives. This is just cheap exercise mat, which I've chopped up to do that. And uh, sticky back Velcro, which you then have to stick on because the sticky back comes off the moment it gets dewy. Focusing, um, mostly for astronomy, you say, if you can, Individual eyepiece focusing is better, and that is because the stars, the starry sky, is a really severe test of optics. And one of the things it's a test of is critical focus. And with center focus binoculars like this, where you're moving the eyepieces, what happens is the moment there's any pressure of your eyes on that, it defocuses them. And, and so it can make it quite irritating. Um, you get ones that are waterproofed as well. They've got little O-rings in there and you get focus lag on them because the O-rings are doing their job. Um, so there's, they're not quite gas tight, but they're almost gas tight. So you, you get focal lag on them. But something like this, individual eyepiece focusing, because you don't have to change focus once you're focused for astronomy, unless somebody else borrows them and refocuses them for them, um, then this is much, much easier. They're not going to get any pressure on it, putting it out of focus, and they're actually easier to waterproof as well. And why do I go on about waterproofing? Because we don't do astronomy in the rain, and the answer is dew. You don't want dew to get inside your kit if you can help it. Um, you get fungus growing in lenses, you get corrosion of anything metal. So, you know, try and try and keep the dew out, just like keep the dirt out. So what do you get? Internet advice, folks. As long as you get binoculars, back four prisms, fully multicoated optics, you can't go far wrong. Oh, yes, you can. I'll show you. So these are two binoculars made in the same factory, 15 by 70. Oh, yeah, they're both 15 by 70. Broadband, fully multicoated, fully broadband, multicoated. That must be the same. Back four prisms, back four prisms. Great. Um, so how different can they be? Well, quite a lot. Let's get rid of this back four prisms thing for a start. Um, in the top one here, which is which is BK borosilicate crown 
glass. You can see just at the bottom of the exit pupil, which is the bright bit of light there, there's two little light gray cutoffs. And that's because the peripheral rays aren't fully, well, they aren't totally internally reflected in the prism. Whereas in this slightly denser back four barium crown glass, uh, back four is a shot AG designation of it, um, you do get full total internal reflection for all rays. But, you know, there's something else going on here. One of these got much better light control, stray light control than the other. You know, so we can, we can tell differences and it's not all to do with how much light's going on in the prism. However, so we do have that. Back four prisms do internally reflect more light, but they've got worse transmission dispersion properties. So, you know, the best, I think, bino viewers, which are things you can put into a single telescope to give you binocular vision through it. Um, the best ones are probably the Denkmayer ones. Guess what glass they use? BK7, because it's got better transmission and dispersion properties. But the Chinese back four, you see, back four is not a definition of glass. Back four is actually just a, a maker's name. So Schott AG, the German glass manufacturer, back four. The Chinese said, oh, well, we'll make a glass. We'll call, we'll call it back four. But, uh, why can't you? You can call it anything you like what you want, because it's not actually a, a, a designation. And it's actually a completely different glass. Um, it doesn't necessarily make it bad. But what is bad about it is it's um, limit its bubble what's called a bubble count limit on it its inclusions you can never make pure glass so you're always going to have you know some microscopic bubbles or little bits of gunge in it you know which you can't see with the naked eye but it'll be there um it's a hundred times greater than shot ag back four and you can tell when you have two of them side by side the chinese ones look slightly milky you won't uh, you know bright bright day when the flowers are in bloom that's the best time to do it and you will notice that anything using the the Chinese back four is there. So this back four thing has actually become just an ad bit of advertising hype. What's much more important is how the prisms are held in. So this one here is held in a proper cage. Those prisms aren't going anywhere. Um, that's the cage having been taken out. This one's held in by a clip. Um, which do you think is more secure? Well, these ones are the ones that you have to keep um, or you may have to keep um, tweaking because you bump them and the prisms slip. All right. So what about the fully multi-coated? Well, this comes as news to people. There's no industry-wide standard what fully multi-coated is. like waterproof. You know, you can say it's, like it's waterproof or water-resistant. Well, what's it mean? Um, if they tell you it's IPX7, then you know, then you know it's something. But industry-wide standards for multi-coating, there isn't one. It can mean your air glass surfaces of the lenses have two layers of coatings. That's multi-coated. Multi or all the air glass surfaces, and that includes the prism hypotenuses, have properly applied seven layer coatings. And that's a different thing. And you can see that in these two binoculars made in the same factory with the same designation. One is reflecting a lot more light internally than the other. Um, and this one, you're getting much more light actually being transmitted down to the down to the eyepiece, which is where you want it. So I think we could say that doesn't mean much. And what about the 15 by 70? Well, here's a setup I looked. If you put a parallel beam of light into the eyepiece of a binocular or telescope, what you get out the other side is the effective aperture. It's just a bit of baking parchment over the end. And that's what I got. And this 70 millimeter binocular is actually 63 mil. And I'll show you how that works in a bit. Um, what they do to do that. But basically, you don't, you don't need to do that. You can do it with a torch on your phone as long as you hold it back about five inches or so from the eyepiece. It's, then what's going in is near uh, parallel. You might be half a percent out or something like that at the end of it. But you can test binoculars like that. A lot of the budget ones are not what they say they are. Um, I tested one um, 50 mil, so-called 50 millimeter binocular for a review and it turned out to be 39 to my mind, that's fraud. So, well, that might not mean anything either. So what is important, it's all this stuff, which they're not going to tell you anyway. Okay, loads of things you might want to know about. Um, don't bother read it all. I'm, this is being recorded. You can, if you're that interested, you can pick it up on the recording. Um, what this is essentially says is 
The only way you can tell is get a few binoculars, take them outside under a starry sky, hold them up to your head, and the one that suits you best is the one you get if you can afford it. Okay, so don't have something like a um, Swarovski EM 10 by 50 amongst the ones you're choosing, unless you can afford the 2,000 quid it's going to cost you when you find it's like holding nothing up to your eyes and finding it magnified. They are fantastic. This is what you avoid. This is the BSO. Uh, no, it's not DSO, it's a BSO. It's a binocular shaped object. This is a horrible piece of kit. Um, I know Bob Meissen's watching this. Bob might remember that when we went and picked this up from a lady whose husband had uh, passed on, or he went to pick it up. I, I had the binoculars, Bob had, had the other stuff. And let's see why it's so bad. Well, for a start, it's a zoom binocular. There is no such thing as a decent zoom binocular, the end. They just can't do it. You couldn't make one um, precisely enough for it to work properly at a price anyone would pay for it. And this thing here is, is being flogged for 80 quid. There is no maker's name on the other side. Well, would you want your name on it? It also has ruby coatings, which is a nice sales gimmick, um, like the gold coatings were in the 1970s, another sales gimmick. Coatings are meant to um, reduce reflection so that more light gets through to your eye. That's a binocular with decent coatings. And you can tell there's a heck of a lot of difference. These were taken um, in the same place on the same kitchen works office as each other um, within about 30 seconds of each other. And yeah, really quite a bit of uh, pre pretty similar. In fact, no, that pair were actually taken at the same time. Ruby coatings reflect light. Here's the reflection from the ruby coatings one. Here's the reflection of the other one. Oh, there isn't any. Yeah. And they reject the red end of the spectrum. Why do they do that? Well, they do it because the red end of the spectrum is quite difficult to correct for when you're trying to get rid of false color. So why not just reflect it back out of the binocular? And the result is, here's looking through the properly one, one is that everything takes on this deathly blue-gray hue. So it looks like the entire universe that you're looking at has undergone some sort of horrible zombie apocalypse or something like that. Uh, it's, this is effectively the result of that. I'm, you also get um, two images for the price of one. And this particular one, I'll just pull it out to show you. This is what they do to reduce the aperture. Because again, in the same way as the red end of the spectrum and the the violet end as well, but they tend to do it with the red end, um, is difficult to correct for. The peripheral rays are difficult to correct for. So you put a socking grape diaphragm in here. This is taken the objective tube out and we're looking down in towards the prisms and you can see that nothing's coated down there as well. So they put a diaphragm in there. So this so-called 70 millimeter binocular is in fact stopped down. So it's effectively a 50 millimeter binocular. And say so there, it gives you, um, two images for the price of one. It doesn't focus properly, so everything has a sort of little dodgy, rather dodgy soft focus to it. You know, the zombie apocalypse, blue-gray, and uh, yeah, and the eyepiece bridge is so rocky that it's quite surprising that um, Sylvester Stallone hasn't sued for copyright. Okay, infringement, how are we doing on time? We'll get there. Okay, so what do you look for? Well, open clusters, asterisms, large diffuse nebulae, but look at all of the, some of these, large faint galaxies, very large globular clusters, some planetary nebulae for very small um, values of the word some, variable stars and double stars. I'm not going to go into variable stars and double stars. There are loads of lists of those and something like the Society for Popular Astronomy actually has a variable star program specifically for binoculars. So it's there, but let's look at the other stuff, shall we? You know, some haven't got moon and planets, because really, if your interest is the moon and bright planets, then really binoculars aren't the thing for you. So large galaxy, M31, um, starting to lose it now. But look what you can see in 10 by 50s. You can see its little satellite galaxies. You can see it brightens towards the core. You can see that what light one side drops off more rapidly than the other side. You're seeing the you can't see the dust lane, but you're seeing the presence of a dust lane in there. Ah, oh, yeah, that's quite impressive, just for something that you could pick up for less than 100 quid. Um, that's M33. Certainly better in something like 10 by 50 
binoculars than the sort of department store type 60 mil telescopes that used to be all the rage. You can actually see it in these. Uh, you magnify it too much and effectively what you're doing is you're looking as, uh, for a sort of slight brightening of the sky as you pass your instrument over it. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's just difficult to see when it's too much. Planetary nebulae, well this is the big brute. There it is, right in the middle there. You might just notice in 10 by 50s that it's slightly rectangular. You might have a really good night. If your binoculars are mounted, we're talking about 10 by 50, you might notice it actually goes in a little bit as well. But that's the big one. All the other planetary nebulae are smaller than this and are therefore more difficult and even less impressive. Globular clusters, well, that's one of the better ones. It actually is one of the better ones for, the, for where we are. The, the one that is potentially slightly better is, is quite far south, so it's usually looking through a lot of air to get to it, a lot of air mass. Um, M13, resolve any stars? No, but you can see it's not a star. Okay, it's like a nice big defocused star. Very pretty when you see it, and you first time you see that, and you're like, oh, well, yes, I can see it. But where these things come into their own is asterisms. Um, this is Kemble's Cascade. Uh, anybody that's known, asterism is just a group of stars that sort of looks like something or looks like they hang together. It's not an official constellation. It's a recognizable group of stars. Um, so this uh, Father Lucian Kemble, a Canadian astronomer, he found this in 7 by 35 binoculars. <coughs> Excuse me. And what it is, is a whole string of faint stars with a bright one in the middle. Um, when I, soon after I came to England, I was observing and say, a uh, uh, friend Bob Myson sort of said, oh, it showed, showed this to me. He said, it's like a wristwatch. And indeed it is. So you can imagine it as a wristwatch. But in autumn, this is vertical as near as makes no difference. And it looks like a little ribbon waterfall going into a little splash pool down the bottom, NGC 1502, I think it is. Um, someone I'm sure correct me if I'm wrong. And it's just lovely and it's a lovely thing to show people. And one of the nice things about doing outreach is if you find asterisms, find things that look like things or find things that people can go wow about and you'll start getting them hooked on this wonderful hobby of ours. And then they can take it further and start doing things which aren't just pretty pictures in the sky. Um, Eddie's Coaster, we worked quite a long time to get this one recognized um, by the um, um, Steve Coe's American astronomer, his um, official, as far as it is, Book of Astrons. Eddie, um, unfortunately, died last year, but he was uh, Eddie Carpenter. He was a uh, member of Cotswold Astronomical Society, and he showed people a little roller coaster in the sky. There it is. It's really easy to see and obvious in 10 by 50 binoculars. It is pretty difficult to see it. In all, all, anywhere else it does even stop and show up on star charts particularly well. Um, that, if you know the W of Cassiopeia, that is the middle star. You put that at the south of the field of view and Eddie's coaster will be in approximately going across the middle. And it's dead easy to find and it's dead easy to see. And you show that, oh wow, isn't that nice? Um, this is one of my favorite objects at this time of year. This is the open cluster Colander 70, and, and normally in a, do this talk in an astronomical side, say, right, who's seen Colander 70? And about three or four hands go up. And then I point out that you've probably all seen it, but you don't look at it because you're all interested in what's a little bit down below that, which is the Orion Nebula. These are the three belt stars of Orion, but look at the stars around here. This is fantastic. And there's all these curves and groups of stars and everything else. So you can spend 20 minutes looking at this, finding more and more stuff. Well, there's a swan, you see it's high and it's neck, it's going up to its wing there. You know, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. And it's this beautiful association of stars. Um, <coughs> it's called OB association, hot blue stars. You'll see them as white, but they are, in, in binoculars in 10 by 50s, but they're actually blue stars. They are really, really fantastic to look at. Um, when you're in that part of the sky, you've got to look at the Pleiades and you can always tell when someone's seen the Pleiades first time in binoculars because they make exactly the same noise as they make the first time they see Saturn's rings in a decent telescope. It's, oh wow, because it's like somebody has just dropped diamonds onto black velvet. It's stunning. And wrong time of year for this at the moment. 
but um, you go down to the southern Milky Way in the summer uh, where it's really, really dense and you just get so, so many stars uh, around here and the, um, the, the star clouds down there. You, you get more stars in your eyepiece than you will anywhere else in the sky. It's absolutely superb. Um, diffuse nebulae, why well, it's bigger binos on, um, on uh, M42. Not so impressive in small binoculars, that one. So where do you find stuff to look at? Well, uh, Nick mentioned at the beginning, um, binocular tour. I write a monthly binocular tour for Sky at Night Mag. So it just gives you six objects, nominally um, a minimum of four of them for 10 by 50s. But uh, I always, all my 10 by 50 objects are stuff I can see in at least in at least as small as 40 mil and nowadays anything I put down for 15 by 70 is stuff I can see in at least as small as 50 mil and that's because I've always had pretty good night vision so I could I've, I've been lucky for visual astronomy or um, every month I produce this free newsletter it's basically what to look at in the sky and you can, get, you can pick that up on my website which is there uh, binocularsky.com. It's free. You can subscribe. You get it sent to you and it just gives you an idea what to look at, including solar system stuff. Obviously, the deep sky stuff doesn't change from year to year because the deep sky doesn't change much from year to year. Okay, a few things like here we're talking about the extra star in Cygnus. Uh, Tri Cygni was getting nice and bright for that one. Or on the same website, you can go to the object thing and um, object selection page, stick in your criteria and It'll throw up a list that matches your criteria. Um, stick what you want there. Or you go to a an all sky chart and the different colors. There is a key, which is not in this presentation, but it is on the actual web page itself. Hover over something, it'll tell you what it is. Click on it. So, okay, white is asterism. You click on it and it takes you to the object page. Hey, we've got Kemper's Cascade there. Tells you how to find it. Um, that's the aperture it tells you so 10 by 50s usually have aperture of uh, uh, five uh, degree field of view or greater so but five degree field of view so, so you get an idea of the scale of what you're looking at in binoculars with the scale of the sky and then a um, bit that describes it an ordinary find a chart and what it might look like if you've got a halfway decent night and tells you a bit about it as well so that's that or alternatively um, if you do want to spend money i've written a couple of books as well which you might find vaguely interesting on this and having whistle stopped through that um i'll say great i hope you at least now some of you believe agree with me that yeah two eyes are actually better than one for looking around and so we all say to each other nowadays do stay safe and i'd be very happy to try and take some questions on the things I've missed out, like mirror mounts and image stabilised binoculars. Hint, hint. <laughs> so thank you very much, Steve. That was really good. Um, and it really sort of makes me want to get out under a dark sky with a decent pair of binoculars and actually look at stuff rather than spend my time imaging things. I think the point you made at the beginning about the fact it can take images 40 minutes to set up was pretty optimistic. I've seen stuff at Kelling where after two hours, images are still <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, and then you've got the auto guiding to get going. Yeah, but yeah. you see, the thing is, if you've got binoculars, once you're imaging, well, you've got nothing to do. So you might as well <laughs> use binoculars. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, there's plenty of time now to take some questions to Steve. So, uh, if you want to ask a question, if you can either do it via the Q&A on um, Zoom or just uh, post a comment on YouTube and uh, I'll come to them in order. So first question is from Daryl Dobbs. Um, he actually asks about uh, these Optocron 11 by 70 and 15 by 70 binoculars, which seem remarkably good value for money, um, I I've seen. He's asking how good are they for variable star work compared to, to something like, say, a Celestron 15 by 70. So choice between 11 by 70 and 15 by 70s in the Optocron. Well, the, the Optocron do both, so the 15 by 70. The th um, I've found the Celestrons give a slight odd colour cast to them. Um, and I prefer the Optocrons, but they do come into that budget end of the, of the um, binocular thing. Now, 
I shouldn't knock them because actually the fact that the Chinese have, have made binoculars that you can pick up, you know, just think of what you're doing. You, for, for less than a price of a halfway decent eyepiece, you're getting two eyepieces, um, two objectives, two prism housings, two focusing mechanisms. I mean, what quality is it reasonable to expect? You know, but it's stunning that they brought these out because it's opened up medium aperture binocular astronomy to people who, until about 25, 30 years ago, couldn't have afforded it because you you were looking at something like Fujinons for 700 quid. So this is great, but there are issues and you, they're not as bright as particularly good ones. And so I prefer the Opticrons. The 11s are only really useful if you've got relatively young eyes that open up to um, more than six millimeters. Okay. So um, do you want to cover exit pupil then, given that you've kind of led into that? Uh, yes. Topic? Exit pupil, it, essentially, if you divide the aperture, so in this case the 70, by the magnification 11, you get six point something. And that is the size, nominally, of the little hole that comes out the back. In fact, we now know that these aren't actually 70s there. Oh, those are still 62s, I think. Um, but they're um, and if it matches your eye's pupil, then you're getting the maximum throughput of light, which is quite useful. Um, but really, I've, I did actually test those Opticron 11 by 70s, and they were great. I went down to Cern Abbas to, in Dorset, to, where the rude giant is, to uh, test those and it were absolutely yeah they're really great under that sort of dark sky they're not that great under a suburban sky i have to say um, but i would go for the opticron over the celestron any day um, not least because opticron's return policy and support policy is so much better um, they're they're local if something goes wrong um they do fix it if it's in warranty and quite often they will fix it if it's not in warranty um, yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, so a question from Keith here. Uh, it says, given a normal budget, and I'm not sure what Keith would consider normal or no. what you consider normal, uh, what's your recommendation for a pair of 10 by 50s? What kind of make would you go for? Well, working on the assumption that all astronomers are cheapskates when it comes to binoculars, um, so you want to spend as little as possible, I, there is one that I think stands out above the others, for, uh, this binoculars under 100 quid. And that is the Opticron, let's see, we're back with Opticron again, Opticron Adventurer TWP. The WP stands for waterproof. Um, the 10 by 50, I think they're about 79 quid or something at first light optics. Um, they are, I have not seen a better 10 by 50 for less than 125 quid, although all prices are going up now, so because of the the effects of the pandemic, but that's, uh, so uh, that's, the, that's the one I would go for if I w wanted to spend less than a hundred quid. I, they are incredibly good. Um, there's a review on the website, which I wrote, so you could you know, see what I think of them then. But I've recommended them to loads of people and they all have said, everyone who's told me that I recommend they've got it, said they're really glad they did because they're so good. I've got a dozen of the slightly smaller ones, the eight by 42s, which I use for outreach with kids because they're, rel they're so reliable as well. I mean, even one of them even survived, found some kid sucking the eyepiece with it. <laughs> anyway, that's not what you wanted to know about. <laughs> but that, that's good. You, you're, you've actually tempted me because I had an old pair of Pentax ones, which I dropped recently, and I've given up trying to realign them. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking looking for something like 10 by 50. So that's, yeah. that's interesting. Um, okay, next question from Phil Pike. He says, thanks, Steve, for the talk. Um, I have some Helios LightQuest 10 by 50s on order which apparently won't arrive until May. Um, and uh, the price increased from 250 to 300 pounds in two months. Can you recommend a good brand of monopod to use with them? Yeah, Manfrotto. Um, Always Manfrotto. I, they're so reliable. And also, if you want a trigger grip, Phil, um, get a used Manfrotto 222. Um, they're, they, they don't make them anymore which is silly because they're the best trigger grip head they, they ever made. But you can pick them up for about 60 quid on eBay, one in, in good condition, and they're really, really good. Um, I have a couple of them. Um, they're, they're fantastic little bits of kit, very, very adjustable. And 
and, re and really worth it. Um, a decent monopod, assuming you're getting aluminium and not going for carbon, um, will, will probably set you back about 30, 30 quid or so. Mm -hmm. so yeah. make, just make sure you get one with, with adjustable um, latches on it so that when it works loose, you can tighten it up. That's the important thing there. Okay, that's good. Uh, next question from Lynn. Um, she says she's been often tempted to buy a pair of image stabilized binoculars. So here we come into the next one that you wanted to, to go into. Um, but they are expensive. Um, and are they worth the money or are they just a bit of a fad? Uh, they're certainly not a bit of a fad. They are fantastic. They are not, I'm, and I really, I really mean it. They, um, and they are pricey, yeah. But when I get to a stage when I can no longer hold binoculars steadily, I will get image stabilized binoculars. Um, I've tested some of the recent ones and the, you, the, the cannons in particular, the, the new cannons, which are very pricey. You can hold them up to your eyes. You can tense your arms so you shake like mad. And you have this bizarre thing of this perfectly steady starry sky with the binoculars shaking around it. It's, it's surreal, but that is, that is how good they are. But the, um, and particularly, I say particularly the new ones, which use the, the same lens stabilization they use in their um, premium lenses. The other ones use, um, they tweak prisms to do it. So a thing called a very angle prism. Um, and the, the, the first generation of those were a bit sort of swimmy you know I, I didn't like mm. them at all but the new ones the the third generation ones are fantastic as well so that's great yeah mm. yeah i mean i've, I've used in canon image stabilized binoculars and they are astonishing well, they are so good yeah but you see the thing is if you look at the price of something like that and you look at my favorite kit which is uh um it's, a, it's the equivalent of the helios light quest 16 by 70 monopod and trigger grip head cost less and I can see more with it. So as long as I, I'm still capable of using that, then yeah, I think I'm better off. But if, if portability is your thing, or if you don't want to carry something heavy around, they are great and they give you a lot of extra depth as well. So I reckon 30 millimeter aperture image stabilized are approximately equivalent to 50 millimeter aperture non-stabilized. So yeah, great, they're great bits of kit. So we had a message on the chat from Keith, who uh, you answered the question about the 10 by 50, saying that astronomers always wanted to spend as little money as possible. I'm not sure he really wants me to read this out because he says we should whisper because his wife's in the next room. But he says, okay. if you wanted to spend a bit more, what would you suggest? Well, so, it depends how much more. You so see, let's say, because the next question actually from Stuart, Stuart Porteous is suggesting 300 pounds. So what would you buy in that region for 10 by 50s? I would stretch up a little bit beyond the 300 and get the Helios Light Quest 10 by 50s in this country. I, they are they are astonishingly good. Um, I've got the the Lunt Magnesium version. They are the brightest 10 by 50s I've ever had, and they are they are lovely. And they're slightly heavier than other stuff, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because that gives you inertia, so they don't shake so much. Mm -hmm. So weight isn't always a problem. Excellent. Good. So we've got loads of questions still to go. So hopefully you don't mind staying no, a little bit longer. No, let, we'll just let's let's run through. Them. Through. Um, so the next one from Matt James is saying, um, could you recommend some good spots in the New Forest or around Cranbourne Chase for some mobile stark aiding when restrictions allow? Yes. You'll keep the secret. You'll keep the best place a secret. No, 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 no. No, we, we, we need to share the good places. But, you know, if, um, if you're going to the good places, just obviously respect the people who are there. Um, Turf Hill is one of the darkest places, um, car park there. A lot of people use it for imaging. So if you're going to the second car park, um, just be aware that there will be people imaging around this are trying to blast them out with your lights. But at least put your lights on dip, not beam as you're going into there. Or park in the first car park and walk. And set all set up around there. There's lots. Of, there's lots of space to do that. Um, watch. Watch out for the shin break breaking height little bollards around the place as well in the dark, and there is a ditch as well somewhere. But it's it's pretty good. Or um, Fordingbridge Astronomers we observe on Hyde Common opposite the junior school. There's a nice big parking place there, and we can hide behind the cricket pavilion to get some shelter from the from the lights on the road. But it's 
that's perfectly good there. And actually, at the zenith, it's actually darker than Turf Hill. Um, so, yeah. Okay, good. That's a couple of good good sites for people to uh, to aim. Oh, and avoid Stony Cross. It looks like it's a wonderful place, and it is during the day. I fly kites there sometimes, but it's a well-known dogging site, so do not go there in the <laughs> evenings. <laughs> Okay, well, that's, that's that's important advice and probably yeah. the first time we've had that kind of advice on a BAA what, what, webinar. Well, T Turf Hill used to be as well until astronomers colonised it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right, yes, well, there you go. So that's a, a reason to encourage astronomers to get out. Um, Bob, your, your friend Bob Meisen has suggested mm. uh, that he thinks perhaps a rotating office chair might be a good basis for a mount. It sounds slightly dangerous to me, but... Um. Oh, Bob, if you noticed, I actually showed you one in the, uh, let's see if I can haul it back up. Let's, where are we? No, go other way. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll dig it up and I'll show you a rotating office chair. It's somewhere in my, in my presentation, but yes, it, it is. It's a great, you know, or as you put it, you know, you've got freedom of motion at azimuth. Sorry, right near the beginning of the talk, wasn't it? Must be getting close now. Uh, no, 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 no. Dear, dear, dear. Should, could be taking another question while we're doing this. Yeah, question, okay. Right? So uh, John Axtell asked a question about what's your preferred mechanism for mounting a red dot finder onto a pair of binoculars? Uh, sticky pads. Any any particular sticky pads? Just... Um, well, something like a Rachel Quick Finder actually comes with sticky pads. I want to know how they how long they last. I've had my my big binos for whoa, um, got them in. When did I come back from Zim? Um, well, I've, I've I've had them for nearly twenty years, and the same sticky pads have held the whole time. So they do. Oh, there. Yeah, there we go. Um, let me just screen share again. So where are we with there? That on the bottom right there is a rotating office chair and a cheap little bench thing, which I support on my knees and holding, just hooking my fingers over the top there. Yeah, so I have complete freedom of motion in the azimuth there. Isn't that, isn't that lovely? So that's a yeah, that's a rotating office chair. It makes it makes a really nice thing to do. You do need to find some way, if you can, of supporting of supporting it. You could use the method I've got there, where the uh, chair just resting my elbows on the chair, which I've got across the armrests. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's loads of ways you can you can do this. But yeah, office office chairs are a, gr a great start. Some people have done those things, and they've actually motorized them using electric drills and bicycle chains and stuff like that. So you can <laughs> you could actually operate it all from your from the comfort of your seat without even having to move your feet around. Yes, That's lovely. Can fall fall asleep and get whizzed around by the mechanics of something like that. But, uh... Um, so Sean uh, says I run the pulsating program, the BAA VSS, and use, he uses binoculars for 80% of his observations. Mm. He says he wants to encourage observers to have a go. And there are two red variables in Kemble's cascade, um, which at the moment are, are worth observing. So um, also he says there are red variables in the double cluster. Mm. And at the moment, if you've got binoculars, uh, go for Z. Uh, so Majoris and T CFI, which are bright yeah. at the moment. So certainly binoculars are, are, I think, used by a lot of variable star observers for brighter stars. Yeah. No, good advice, Sean. Thank you. Um, question from an anonymous attendee. It says, um, I have a pair of Canon 50 by 50 image stabilized binos that are old are going to be replaced. Any ideas for a replacement? Um, yeah, probably the, the 42s. Um, they're not as heavy. Mm -hmm. um, we have somebody in the in the Wessex Astro um, who has a pair of those, and they are incredibly good. <laughs> they, you know, if you, and then they're not as heavy as the fifth as the fifteen. So yeah, they they're they're forty twos, and and the nice thing about the forty twos is they're waterproof. It's the I think the only waterproof Canon image stabilized. So yeah, it's a good one to go for. And um... I think the last question we have at the moment, but it's a, it's an interesting question and it's something I'd be interested to hear your opinion on. 
and it's from Olaf. And he says, what do you think about the, the wide field Galilean binoculars that seem to be all the rage at the moment? So, you know, two times magnification binoculars, those. I have some. I've got the Vixen ones. Um, 2.1 by 42s nominally. Forget everything you thought about binoculars before. This is binocular, you know, binocular astronomy, but not as we know it, Jim. It's, it, re it really is. It's a completely different experience. You're not hunting out faint fuzzies or anything like that. You're enjoying beautiful star fields. What it does is it gives you about a magnitude, magnitude and a half extra. You don't notice the magnification. So what it's doing is it's taking, it's giving back what light pollution has taken away. And I just think they, they're so lovely just for sort of looking around, um, you know, looking around the Milky Way, you know, but, uh, particularly the, the winter Milky Way, I think is, is, is gorgeous with it. Um, summer Milky Way is gorgeous with it as well. And if you can get to a dark site, they're even better. They are Stunningly good. I really like them. Yes, they are niche, um, but the amount of time I use mine and just enjoy using them, you know, this is the thing that tells is, is it worth it or not? And yeah, I, I, rec I reckon they're worth it. There's loads of options now. You've mentioned the Kasai. The Kasai, actually, you can get like a little helmet thing for them, so you can actually wear them mounted on your head. I've seen um, some pictures of people wearing those. <laughs> yeah, um, they're, they're great. Um, Omegon do them, um, slightly less expensive, I think, and Orion have just brought out a 54 millimeter version. Um, but f forget everything you thought you knew about binoculars when you, when you start using those, because one of the things is your field of view depends on how close you got your eyes to the eyepiece. So the closer you get your eyes, the greater your field of view. The actual exit pupil, which would normally be between the eye lens and your eye is actually between the objective and it's a virtual exit pupil. It's between the objective and the eyepiece. So you'll never get your eye to, to the exit pupil of that. They are, they're just lovely. They, mm. it's, it's just, if it's about enjoyment, this is the, they are delightful. They really are. Yeah, I've, I've got a pair of the Vixen ones because I think they were the first people or almost the first to come up with them. And I've used it in La Palma and they are stunningly good. Oh, but man. the one thing I found a bit disconcerting is because they're Galileans, the image goes off really towards the edge of the field. And you have to kind of not concentrate on that, because if you start trying to look at the edge of the field, it, it's a bit weird. But if you just take them as they are, I think they yeah. are brilliant. Well, well, yeah, I mean, it's. You know, just think of, you, you don't have to look around the field, just move your head around <laughs> with them. Yeah. That's, yeah, it's, it's easy enough. Yeah. Okay, so good. So they, they, they come with your um, your recommendation. Then. Oh, I, I, I like them. Yeah. I, I don't know many people. I'm, the only horrible thing about them is they're so, they're so small that the first few times you use them, you have fingers all over the objectives. <laughs> Smudge them. Okay, so thank you very much, Steve. That's really, really good, um, interesting um, run through the advantages of binoculars. And I think it's a good antidote to, to a lot of the things we hear where observing gets more and more and more complex. I think uh, simplicity often has lots of things going for it, particularly in our climate. So thank, thank you very much. And thank you very much for answering the questions too. And uh, thank you very much to the audience. So... Um, that, Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, that is, uh, I think, the next meeting. I'm just, I should just check this. Yes, the next meeting we've got is the BAA meeting, which is on March the 31st. Um, and uh, we have uh, in that meeting uh, Professor Demetra Rigopoulou is talking about Oxford Lighthouses and uh, Oxford. Oh, I should have read this before, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, Professor Demetra Rigopoulou from Oxford is talking about lighthouses in the universe, the tale of very luminous infrared galaxies. Mm -hmm. So that's um, on Saturday, Wednesday, God, Wednesday, March the 31st, uh, starting at 7 p.m. So hopefully we'll see everybody there again. So thank you very much, Steve. I need to do a few things just to stop the recording and get things closed down um, and then we'll sign off. All right. Well, good night, everybody. And as they say, stay safe.
Thank you.